Hi, I'm MF Thomas, and this is My Dark Path. The First World War is the first conflict defined by the use of modern technology. This is especially true when it comes to military aircraft. Fighters, bombers, and scout planes all have their origins in that terrible conflict. Airships had their place as well. At the beginning of the war, they could fly high above the range of any fighters or anti-air guns and drop bombs at will. While bombing from a Zeppelin was wildly inaccurate, it was a potent psychological weapon, and Germany took full advantage while they could. But as the Allies developed better fighter aircraft, explosive ammunition, and improved their night fighting tactics, German usage of Zeppelins as warships dwindled, with their last raid taking place in March of 1918. Sadly, it was during the war that the Zeppelins lost their namesake, the man who'd shepherded them from experimental vision to thriving reality. Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin passed away in March of 1917. For a while, German Zeppelins were out of the picture. The Treaty of Versailles, which ended the First World War, actually forbid Germany from constructing airships. It was only the persistence of one man that kept the Zeppelin story from ending right there. His name was Hugo Eckner. Eckner started his career as an author and journalist. He covered the flights of the original Zeppelins, the LZ-1 and LZ-2. Although he praised von Zeppelin's ambitions and genius, he was ruthless in criticizing the shortcomings and limitations of these early designs. Von Zeppelin's response was an unusual one. He offered Eckner a job. This may be an early example of, quote, learning to code. Eckner became a publicist for his company, immersing himself in airship knowledge. He even studied the process of flying them and earned his airship pilot's license in 1911. Eckner inherited the company from von Zeppelin, but his primary product was legally prohibited. So he came up with an ingenious solution. Germany owed reparations to the countries it had fought against in the war, including America, but its economy was in shambles. Eckner proposed building a Zeppelin for the United States Navy, which would help Germany pay its debts, as well as loosen the ban. The two governments accepted his proposal, and LZ-126 was built and christened the USS Los Angeles. In 1924, Eckner personally captained the ship across the Atlantic to deliver it to the United States. Eckner was determined to bring the Zeppelin back to prominence, not as a weapon of war, but as an icon of adventure and luxury. And his next Zeppelin, the LZ-127, was designed from the start to make an overwhelming impression. It was 776 feet long, the largest possible ship that could still fit in the company's hangar. Running on a unique fuel called Blaugas, which was very similar to propane, it could fly at an astonishing 73 miles per hour. The interior was built to attract a high-class clientele with sleeper cabins, a main sitting room with viewing windows, and art deco furniture, as well as a galley that could make three hot meals a day. Pilots were even instructed not to pitch the craft more than five degrees up or down, except in an emergency, so as not to disturb the wine bottles. LZ-127, rechristened the Graf Zeppelin, was an ocean liner in the sky and faster than leading ships of the day. Eckner created a worldwide atmosphere of Zeppelin fever. He piloted the Zeppelin himself on its first transatlantic flight in 1928, and survived a terrifying storm which tore off the covering of the tail fin. Eckner's own son, Newt, ventured out onto the fin with a rigging team to repair it mid-flight. The airship successfully reached America, flight time 111 hours. 
Then, in 1929, the Graf Zeppelin took off from Lakehurst, New Jersey, on an attempt to fly all the way around the world. The Hearst Media Empire helped underwrite the voyage. Passenger tickets sold for nearly $50,000 in today's currency. Eckner also rented out space aboard for another lucrative service, carrying mail. People would pay handsomely just to send a commemorative postcard aboard this miraculous ship. The Graf Zeppelin's journey was every bit the global sensation Eckner envisioned. Crowds greeted it as it stopped at major cities. And in just 21 days, five hours and 31 minutes after it took off, it landed right back where it started in Lakehurst, New Jersey. It was the fastest trip around the world. But even while the Zeppelin was one of the most visible and beloved examples of German ingenuity, the company was rapidly falling out of favor with its home country. Eckner was vocally opposed to the rise of the Nazi party, and given his heroic status with the public, he was even encouraged to run for president in 1932 against Hitler. He chose not to run, instead supporting the incumbent, President Paul von Hindenburg. Von Hindenburg won the election and blocked an attempt by the Nazis to arrest Eckner in 1933, but his power was already waning. In a doomed effort to unify his country, he appointed Hitler chancellor, and he would be dead just a year later, leaving the Nazis to rule unchecked. The new German government seized control of Eckner's company and began to overrule safety procedures in the interest of making flights that had the greatest propaganda value. While under Eckner's leadership, Zeppelins had carried passengers for over one million air miles without a single serious injury. But now, everything was changing. When we remember the Hindenburg airship, we remember the flames. That raging storm of fire consumed the great vessel in just 35 seconds. To this day, we don't know for certain what ignited the flames. Some have even dramatically suggested sabotage. But the dominant theory is the same cause which doomed the LZ-4, static discharge. The LZ-129, christened the Hindenburg in honor of the late president, was designed for helium. But when it launched in 1936, it was lifted by a fordable, but extremely flammable, hydrogen gas. Before this tragic event, the Hindenburg continued pushing the boundaries of luxury. For a while, its lounge contained a specifically designed baby grand piano. As every pound counts in air travel, this piano was made mostly of aluminum alloy and only weighed 400 pounds. The airship, despite the dangers of hydrogen, even had a smoking lounge. Now, you had to pass through an airlock to get into this pressurized chamber, and you could only smoke the cigarettes and cigars sold on board. The Hindenburg made 63 successful flights, and along with its sibling, the Graf Zeppelin, was the pride of Germany. When heavyweight boxer Max Schmeling won the title by knocking out Joe Lewis, his triumphant flight home was on the Hindenburg. But it's the tragedy of May 6, 1937, that we remember today. When the Hindenburg left Frankfurt, Germany on May 3rd, it was a seasoned, well-maintained craft, the pinnacle of decades' worth of design improvements and field testing. Its captain, Max Pruss, was a veteran airship pilot who had crossed the Atlantic 171 times. And Eckner's own longtime right-hand man, Ernst Lehmann, was aboard as a senior observing officer. At 7.21 p.m., it arrived at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Landing lines were tossed out to be caught by the ground crew to tie the ship down. And then, four minutes later, it exploded. The legendary commentary by Herbert Morrison was not broadcast live. He was simply recording a report for radio station WSL in Chicago. Listeners that evening were the first to experience his narration of that horrifying event. Later, newsreel film shot of the event was synced up to his commentary, and moviegoers across the nation were able to see and experience the disaster on the big screen. 
spoken in flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just beaming around it. When George Méliès made his short film about the 1902 dirigible explosion, he needed special effects. But this was the disaster itself, captured by mass media with a visceral power few people had ever experienced. The power of those seconds of film and audio wiped away all the other stories about the Hindenburg and about airships in general. The fact that 61 of the 97 people aboard survived didn't register. The heroism of Captain Pruss, who continued to guide the burning ship toward the ground and then carried his own radio operator out of the wreckage while he himself was scarred for life by the flames, was forgotten. This was not even the greatest loss of life in the history of airships, and it paled in comparison with the death toll of the Titanic. But the global shock wrought by that footage became the story. The Graf Zeppelin was in the midst of its own transatlantic voyage when the news arrived of the Hindenburg's destruction. It landed safely in Brazil one day later, but this was the last overseas commercial flight of any airship. The Nazis melted down its airframe to build military aircraft. Despite the public's sudden shift in confidence, airships were active on both sides in the Second World War. With their plentiful supply of helium, the American Navy built over 100 blimps. Two of them actually served as flying aircraft carriers with hangars that could carry, launch, and land up to five small fighters. The so-called K-class patrol blimps were one of the greatest tools available for locating and tracking enemy submarines. They could accompany patrols and convoys, logging tens of thousands of flights. Through the entire war, only one convoy ship was ever sunk by a submarine while a K-class blimp was watching over. And only one blimp was ever shot down, blimp K-74. It was hit by one of the very submarines it was hunting. All of the crew survived, except one. He was eaten by a shark. And what comes after? Count von Zeppelin's LZ-1 launched in the year 1900, and airships seemed like they would be there every step of the 20th century as humans invented, discovered, and further explored the globe. Instead, after World War II, the story felt effectively over. Goodyear, which had helped build the K-class blimps in World War II, kept building airships. Their blue and gold fleet today is iconic for carrying their corporate logo through the skies over sporting events. But it seems so disconnected from the airship story. Its appearance is like a ritual that we've forgotten the origins of. But there are signs that the story may not be as done as we might think. In 1993, Zeppelin, the very company Count von Zeppelin founded, was revived from its dormant assets. Taking the records and designs left behind and applying modern materials and avionics, they've built what they call the Zeppelin NT, or New Technology. Zeppelin NTs are still launching today and are being used for flight training, advertising, surveying, and yes, even carrying tourists. Meanwhile, a UK company called Hybrid Air Vehicles has created what's called the Airlander 10. It's a semi-rigid helium airship used to carry tons of cargoes to places where there are no airport runways. The next generation airship on their drawing board, the Airlander 50, could fit up to 200 passengers. So maybe there's another chapter yet to the Zeppelin story. Maybe, slowly but surely, that sense of wonder can be reborn. Thank you for watching this episode of My Dark Path. I'm MF Thomas, the creator and host. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and then subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll always know when we upload a new episode. Also, please take a moment and share this video with someone else who may enjoy it. This will really help our channel grow. And if you like My Dark Path, you can find dozens of our podcasts on any podcast network or you can listen at www.mydarkpath.com. Again, thanks for walking the dark paths of history, science, and the paranormal with me. Until next time, good night.